Our reading today is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, but that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Thank you, Lauren. Well, good morning. It is really good to see everyone here this morning, and it is really good to know that you are out there in uh, cyberspace watching us. Um, why don't you wave? We couldn't see that. Uh, I love that we have a number of our college students back. Um, I want to say something about how this church thinks. This church absolutely does not believe that our children, our youth, and our college students are the future of this church. We absolutely believe that you are the present of this church, that you are every bit as much a part of this church as anyone else. And we are delighted that God is working in you and through you while you are in our midst. Um, you're going to actually see a really cool example of that next week, by the way. Um, I'm just looking forward to that. Well, uh, in a different life, I was a youth pastor. Where's Jordan? I wonder if Jordan is fully bought on or fully been made aware that this has now been part of his job description. Uh, as part of being a youth pastor, and what I did is I taught people how to drive. Uh, I would say a good 30 to 35 percent of those people are still alive. Um, <laughs> but that was definitely part of the unwritten job description that I had is that sometimes parents would pick up the phone or come knocking at the door and say, my kid just turned whatever, um, and here, go teach him how to drive. Which was really interesting because where I lived was in a very mountainous part of Oregon, and I had a stick shift. So um, they learned a lot. Now, one of the things that was really fascinating, and for those of you who who have learned how to drive, you will probably remember this moment, or if you've taught someone how to drive, you will remember the moment that you had your first lesson, you got into the car, you sat down behind the steering wheel, and panic started to grow. And you realized what seemed like a really cool, fun thing was now a little intimidating. And you're sitting there thinking, now what do I do? And you haven't even turned on the car yet. Right? And then you turn on the car, and over the next, oh, I don't know, hour, every four seconds, you're going through this, now what do I do, seasoned with panic. Most important come to realize the most important thing that is happening in that moment, the most important thing that is in that car at that moment is not the brake, it's not the steering wheel, it's not the accelerator, it is that hopefully calm person who is sitting in the passenger seat telling you, this is what you do next. Anyone else feel a little bit like it's the first day of learning how to drive and you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, now what do I do? You just keep asking God, what do I do now? 
School is starting up. Now what do I do? Mom has decided to homeschool me. Now what do I do? My business can't open. Now what do I do? My friend just went on one more rant about masks or police or Black Lives Matters or some other issue where we disagree. Now what do I do? And we keep waiting for God to tell us, start your turn here. Hit the brake here. Floor it here. last major section of the book of Romans as we work through our series in Romans is going to deal with the question of now what do I do? Now let's remember what has been going on in the book of Romans. And it, we saw that the, the key verses, the, the, the core of the book of Romans is summarized in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And if you remember, here's what's going on in the book of Romans. You've got a church that is made up of two groups of people. You've got the Jewish community who had originally been in charge of the church in Romans, but they had actually been exiled. And after they were exiled, the Gentiles who they had led to Christ had taken over leadership. Well, Eventually, those Jews were allowed to come back to Rome, and they're back into a church that looks different. They are no longer in charge. Gentiles are doing things Gentile ways. And there is tension that's developed. What is it supposed to look like to be the church of God when you have these two groups coming together. And Paul is addressing that tension all throughout the book by showing them how to resolve the tension. And what he's showing them is, if you want to know how to relate to one another, if you want to know how to be the church, how to be the body of Christ, you have to understand the nature of righteousness and the nature of the gospel. The gospel shows us the true nature of righteousness. And once you know that, you will know how to live because the righteous live by faith. And here's how that theme is developed throughout the book of Romans. In the first 11 chapters, we get an understanding of righteousness is and the fact that it comes from God. And so Paul is laying this foundation that if you understand that every single person, it doesn't matter how religious you were when you were growing up. It doesn't matter if you never thought about God while you were growing up. Every single person is separated from God by nature. They are rebellious against God. And it is only by God's gracious gift of Jesus on the cross who was raised three days later that we can be in relationship with God at all. And it is Jesus' perfect life that gets credited to us when we become a follower of Christ. And that is what makes us righteous. And we just finished going through this section, last foundation for how do you think about what is righteous, what is righteous, and that is going to lead him to say, now in light of all of that, this is how you live. And that's where we are now. We are entering the second section, the righteous live by faith. Now, here's what's fascinating. He is not going to start by giving you a list of things to do. He's going to do something far more important. He's going to set the tone for the rest of the book by talking about how you Because how you think is the heart of what you do. It's where what you do comes out of. How we think is foundational to our life with God. 
And Paul is going to show in these two verses, first, what it is that we are called to do. That's verse 1. And then verse 2, he's going to talk about how it is possible for us to do it. And we're going to look at each one of those verses in turn, and then we're going to step back and look at some bigger principles that really apply across multiple areas of life. But the first thing we want to do is start where Paul starts with what is it that we are to do, and we are to give our lives as worship to God. Now, verse 1 starts with an appeal. He calls out, this is something I want you to do that is so important. And, and that appeal comes in the form of a command. And here is the foundational command. We are to present your bodies as a sacrifice to God. That's the command. That's what Paul is appealing for us to do. Present your bodies as a sacrifice to God. Bodies is just a way of saying yourself. Present how you go about daily life. Present how you get up in the morning and treat your brother. Present how you go through your day at work or at school. Present those things as a sacrifice. It's interesting that this word present and sacrifice actually went together in the original language. Um, Present is the word that was used for when you make an offering and put that offering on the altar. It's the word that was used to describe what is going on when you take a small animal as part of the sacrificial system and, and you kill that animal in worship to God. And think about what a sacrifice shows. A sacrifice shows trust in God, right? You're, you're giving up something that is important to you, that is, that is valuable to you. If you're, if you're sacrificing a lamb, that lamb represented income to you. It's an act of devotion, right? When they originally sacrificed animals, they were giving up something that they had every right to keep. And it's also a declaration of reality, right? When they were doing these sacrifices, what they were enacting is the price of sin. They were enacting the reality that sin costs a life. Here's the core command. Here's what verse one is saying. Give your daily life as an expression of trust and devotion to God. The reason that he gives to do this is because of the mercies of God. This is simply referring to, to his acts of compassion. You can think about it as, in a sense, everything he's talked about in, verse, in chapters 1 through 11. All his acts of compassion. The fact that he gave Jesus his only son to die on the cross so we can be in relationship with him. The fact that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in your life right now, changing you, transforming you, empowering you. The fact that the Father is always at work, caring for you and protecting you and providing for you. In light of that, in light of all that God has done for you, the only logical response is trust and dedication. That's where the command comes in. And here's how he describes that act of trust and dedication. It is a living sacrifice. And that's another way of saying it's your day-to-day -day life. It's holy. That means it's dedicated to God and it is pleasing to God. He is describing a life, the day-to-day -day life that's dedicated to God and is pleasing to him. And he ends by saying that, that life that is true worship. That is what worship is all about. So here's what verse 1 is saying. In light of God's acts of compassion, in light of the love that he has shown you, give yourself as an act of trust and devotion to God. Dedicate your day-to-day -day activities to his service and to pleasing him. And as you do this, this is true worship. Quick aside, this is just for free. 
there are people who walk into churches every Sunday. And all through the week, they have lived their lives as a dedication to self. And when they walk in the door, they get upset that the worship leader, the worship team, doesn't lead them in worship. You have a completely wrong idea of worship if that is your thinking. Worship is not the emotion that you generate because someone is singing a certain song. It is a response to the living God who is at work in your life. And that is something that should happen all through the week. And when it come, we come together, we are bringing together and responding to God for what he has done in us individually and in our lives collectively. Um, it has a whole lot less to do with the people up here than with what has been going on in your heart all week long. So if you find yourself you can't worship, if, if you can't worship, if you can't respond in worship to the acts of compassion that God has displayed in your life, I would suggest it has a lot less to do with the people up here than with what's going on in your heart. That's just a freebie. Um, obviously, what we have to do up here is, is important, but I am just encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, back to the sermon now. Um, you see what Paul is giving us here? He's giving us a picture of what a follower of Christ looks like. But the problem is that we wrestle with is how do I become that person? When I look at my bank account and see that my bank account is, is desperately low, and I'm supposed to be this living sacrifice, how do I do that? When my parents are annoying me like crazy, does that ever happen? What does it mean to be a living sacrifice and how do I become that person? When my best friend, or worse, when my boyfriend or girlfriend has just broken up with me and said, we're just going to be friends. Um, what does it mean to actually be a living sacrifice and how do I become that person in that moment? And that is exactly what Paul is going to address in verse 2. And what he says that we are to do is mind what your mind is becoming. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. That is the key. That is the process of becoming a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world refers to what a sculpture would do in, in forming clay. In, in, making, in making a sculpture, it, it's the idea of being shaped or molded into the image of something. And it's saying, do not be shaped or molded into the thinking and the values and, and the, and the decision-making of this world. And what's interesting, some of your translations say this present world. And that's actually a really good translation. Because there's also this emphasis on what you're being molded into is temporary. What does it look like to be conformed into this world? I'm going to ask you some questions. And I want you to really think about the answer to the question. What first comes to your mind? Who is your example of a successful person. Don't say it out loud. Please don't say it out loud. Just think about it. Who is your example of a successful person? What makes that person successful? Here's another question. Who is your picture of a good person? Just think about who comes to your mind? And then answer the question, why did you pick that person? What is it about that person that makes them good? Now, this is where we get to the hard part. You see, being conformed to this present world means that what comes to your mind is going to be determined by the standard of success, the standards of right and wrong, of what is valuable, that are shaped 
See, if what came to your mind when you think of success was someone like Bill Gates, that tells you that your definition of what the good life is and what success is has been determined by the values of this world. The command that Paul gives us is do not allow this world to turn you into a picture of it. Do not allow this world to be able to point to you and say, if you know what the world, you want to know what the world's values are like, if you want to know how the world makes decisions, if you want to know how the world thinks, just, just look at this person here. Paul is saying we cannot be shaped, molded, conformed by this world. Instead, we are to be transformed. And how are we to do that? We are to be transformed by the renewal of, you could even literally say the remaking of your mind. It's an inside-out process, right? Think about teaching someone to drive. You don't just teach a person how to drive and say, well, I'm going to teach you what the steering wheel does. I'm going to teach you what the brake does. I'm going to teach you what the pedal does. Okay, uh, oh yeah, here's the turn signal. No one ever uses that anyway, um, it, which is very unfortunate. Um, you also want to teach them how to think like a good driver, right? You want to teach them how to be aware like a good driver. You want to teach them how to react like a good driver. It's not just about doing this technique. There's an inside-out thing that is going on. And renewing the mind is, is just like that. And I want you to notice that it is passive, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is something that God does, but we allow. And what's the result of us allowing God to remake, to renew our minds? The result is that by testing, by experiencing, by, by the events of life, we discern what the will of God is. What does that mean? What it does not mean is that we discern every morning what socks God wants us to wear. What it means is that we understand what are God's purposes. What is God doing? What does God desire in this situation? It's the awareness that God is at work in this situation and an awareness that we have something to do to participate in his purpose. So your boyfriend breaks up with you and the question that you ask is, what is God doing here? You inherit a million dollars unexpectedly. You still ask the exact same question. What is God's purpose? What is God doing here? Something very neutral happens in your life that you don't even thirst. Even in that situation, you have to ask, what is God doing here? See, here's what the renewed mind looks like. What the renewed mind looks like starts with the recognition that God is at work. It starts with the recognition that God has a purpose. God is always at work. To do something. Let me promise you, if you know nothing else, you know there's one thing that God is always at work doing in every situation, every moment of your life, and every moment of the life of the loved ones around you. He is always at work to make you like Christ. Right, so a renewed mind approaches something like COVID and recognizing that God is doing something. He's doing lots of things, but one of the things you know for certain that he is doing is he is helping people live out the intention of becoming more like Christ. He's putting people in positions of trusting him. He's putting people in positions of, of sacrificing for others. He's putting people in positions where their definitions of success and security and right and wrong are being refined. That's the first thing. A renewed mind clues into that. God is at work and he is always at work to shape me and to shape others to be more like Christ. A renewed mind recognizes that there are influences of this present world that are at work in our lives all the time. 
This world is going to use something like COVID to reinforce its values and its way of thinking. Give you an example. What does Philippians 2 tell us? That we must consider others as more significant, as more important than ourselves. What does our culture say? What about me? What are my rights? Put my own interests first. And we can feel that tension within us. A renewed mind desires to be a part of God's work. And, and it, it has an understanding of how to be a part of God's work. COVID has not for one second stopped our mission as a church. Why? Because we absolutely understand what our mission is. Our mission is to be a part of the process that God uses to make people to be more like Jesus. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who lives out the intention of becoming more like Jesus. We are to be a part of that process. But how we do it has changed. And I'm not just talking about what programs we can or can't do. And I'm not just talking about the fact that we need to do a WANA online, although those are really good examples. I'm talking about the fact that God has given us extraordinary opportunities in one another's lives to deal with questions and issues that weren't coming up otherwise. For example, I... If someone says or someone is, is feeling that they have to break fellowship with someone else because of their view on wearing or not wearing masks, that is an opportunity for us to step in as a discipleship issue and say, why is that more important to you than the unity of the body of Christ? It's just bubbling these types of issues to the surface. And that is what the church and the church as us as people need to be stepping into. What is our role in renewing the mind? We said it's passive, but we allow it. We make space for it. We make space for what the Holy Spirit is doing through these five things. And there are other things, but these five things I think are really important. The first is we must have first-hand encounters with Scripture. This is when you are directly reading or studying and implying God's Word, whether you're doing it alone or one-on-one -on -one or, or in a group. At FBC, life groups are supposed to be a first-hand encounter of Scripture. Whether you're using a video, whatever you're using, the whole point is at some point you're opening up the Bible and saying, what does the Bible say? Secondhand encounters of Scripture. Someone else has done the study and they are teaching you from it. And these are incredibly important. Sermons are an example. For you, this is a secondhand experience of God's Word. For me, it was a firsthand experience of God's. If all you rely on are sermons or books or podcasts or watching videos, all you're getting are secondhand experiences with Scripture. But those are important. Because this is someone who has done the firsthand experience and now is filtering it back to you and saying, here's the significance of this. Here's what this means. Here's why this is important. So they're an important part of what you do. Uh, and we need to have them to have our minds remade. Third thing is prayer. And what I'm talking about here is not just praying for your meal, as important as that is. I'm talking about the prayer that goes on throughout the day that keeps you focused on how God is working. This is something I feel like the Lord has really been working on in my life recently. And I'm trying to be more and more disciplined about every time I walk into a meeting with someone, every time I walk into church, every time I walk into the office, every time I, I just do any, I go downstairs. I want to constantly be praying, God, I depend on you in this moment to reflect your character and to be like Christ. Every moment throughout the day, I'm trying to discipline myself. And that 
the Holy Spirit takes that and shapes your thinking. Testing is simply using the word from verse 2 to refer to obediently acting in faith. Right? So if, if the Lord calls you to sacrifice financially to support someone else, you stepping out in faith and obeying that, even if it's going to cost you something uh, in, in terms of your security, in terms of having to give up something that you were going to purchase, the Lord meets you in that, and he shapes how you think. And the last one seems obvious, but it's probably the one that we do the least. It's reflection. It's just taking time to sit and think. It's taking time to sit and reflect how is God working and showing who he is in my life. It's being quiet and paying attention to his mercies. And as you do that, you will discover that that actually becomes a really sweet time of worship with him. Here's what verse 2 is saying. You are turning into something. You are either becoming a picture of the world or you are becoming a picture of Christ. You are always moving in one of those directions. If you are becoming a picture of Christ, then you are becoming a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I want to identify quickly two principles that I think apply across multiple areas of our lives that we need to keep in mind based on this passage. The first is that we have to evaluate the messages that we receive from our culture. Our culture is always telling us something. And it's good to ask questions of advertisements, political speeches, movies, shows, things that we read. What do they want me to believe? Is it true? Is it complete? So what? When a politician tells you that he is your hope for the future, a bell should go off in your head that says, this guy wants me to think that my well-being is up to him. That's what he wants me to believe. And that is not true. I can still support that politician. I can still think he's the right or she's the right person to be in charge of the city or state or country or whatever. But we catch our thinking when they want to fill a role that they shouldn't play. When someone says giving up your rights isn't American, as I had someone say to me, a bell should go off that says they want me to think that American values should govern my life. Now I'm making you nervous. That is okay, but it's incomplete. It doesn't go far enough. You see, ultimately, my values are shaped by the kingdom of God. And those will always outweigh the kingdom of men. The kingdom of God constantly calls me to give up my rights. Constantly. So what? Why does it matter? Why does it matter that my hope is in God and not a politician? Because I can vote how I think is best, but be at peace no matter what happens. Why does it matter that my highest citizenship is in the kingdom of God? Because it means that right and wrong is defined by popular vote. If my country decides that abortion is okay by popular vote, I look at it and say the kingdom of God says no, it's not. I can stand up for what is wrong even if I'm out of step. Stand up for what is right against what is wrong, even if I'm out of step. Second principle, always ask how you can support what God is up to. We've alluded to this a number of times. This one question will help you make huge strides in renewing your mind. I'll give you an example. We as a family just received some really good news that has related to the uh, settling of my mother's estate who passed away a few years ago. We just got this two days ago. So for me, I have to ask the question in the midst of really good news, what is God up to and how do I support it? 
So supporting what God is up to in this case means paying attention to the heart issues that are coming up. So I've got to be paying attention to things like, am I grateful to the Lord? Am I really seeing the connection that this blessing was provided by the Lord and is not just something that came because a lawyer worked really hard somewhere? The more disciplined you are about asking this question, the more the events of your life that happen every day become a filter for you to see God at work, and it will transform your mind. It will remake, renew how you think. Now what do I do? The answer for every situation is to be a living sacrifice. In light of all the compassion God has shown in your life, give yourself as an act of devotion to him in your daily life. Dedicate your daily life activities to his service and to pleasing him. And doing this will be your act of worship. And how do I become that living sacrifice? By allowing the Holy Spirit to renew, to remake how it is that you think. So this is the point that Paul was driving at in in these two verses. Renewed thinking is foundational to life with God. And the implication for that for us from that, is that we must pay attention to what is shaping our thinking every day, all throughout the day. So, how many of you drove here and don't really remember driving here? And specifically what I'm talking about is you don't really remember thinking about when you turn the steering wheel when you hit the gas, when you hit the brake. You didn't really think about the distance that you kept between you and other cars. Of course you don't. Because when it comes to driving, your mind has been renewed. You do those things automatically. And even if you you come into a situation that is totally brand new, you have the skills, you have the way of thinking that allows you to respond to it in, in the best way. And you're not sitting through every event just wondering, what do I do next? And panicking a little. And that is exactly what the Lord wants to do in your life, in in your relationship with him. That you know the right thing to do automatically. Even if you encounter something completely new, the way you think about it has matured to a point that you can respond to. And that is exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing in you, according to Romans 1 and 2. Allow him to do that work. Here are some suggestions for how you can make some space for the Holy Spirit to do that work. Again, I'm encouraging you to rewrite the passage. Two short verses that's really, really helpful to get the thinking into your mind by taking the time to rewrite it. Also helpful is memorizing it. These are two really, really important verses to kind of have at the tip of your brain. Spend some time questioning media this week. Pay attention. What are they trying to sell you? What worldview are they trying to get you to buy into? What are they trying to get you to think is is good and right? What are they trying to get you to think is the definition of the good life? And how are they inviting you to achieve it? What is the implied picture of what God is like? And always, almost always, the answer is going to be God is absent. It's up to you. And what are people like? It will be something like people are fundamentally good. And in no way broken or need a savior. And then pray for the Holy Spirit to remake your thinking, especially about what God is like.
God is in the business of bringing mercy and compassion into your life every day. And he invites you to respond to that by thinking a little more like Jesus. Would you join me in prayer that God will do that work in us even today? Father, we are so grateful that your compassion, your mercy, these things are active in our lives every single day. And Lord, we confess to you that we lose sight of that. And because we lose sight of that, we lose sight of how we should respond as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. But Lord, we thank you that as part of your compassion, you forgive us for that. And you set us back on, your, on our feet and you help us move forward. And Lord, we ask you for that today that you would help us move forward in thinking with renewed minds that we might be more like Christ, discerning your will even automatically in situations, knowing how to join what you are doing. And Lord, we thank you that you are doing that work within us. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So before we go, let me say this. This is what we have said about God. And again, if you're new here, the most important thing that you will ever take away from a sermon or from what happens on Sunday morning is not a to-do list. It's this is who we have said God is. And who we've said God is, is this. God is a person who, God is an actor in compassion. He, he is always, in every moment of our lives, working in his mercy and his compassion. And God is remaking you from the inside out. And so the challenge for you as you leave is to join his work this week by minding what your mind is becoming. You're dismissed. If you want to pray with someone, we are going to have folks at the right at the table to my right in the lobby, and they will be uh, there to pray with you no matter what you need. And uh, we look forward to seeing you or joining you online next week.